there are 76 million of us just here in the US. We are the biggest generation that ever existed. We were called the me ones, the crazy ones, and boy, do we know what that means, don't we? In fact, we have reinvented every single phase of our life. We were the yuppies, we were the hippies. We like innovation. Well, now we are in the winter of our life. And I can assure you, this is not going to be your average winter. I invite you to join me at Boomerology Reviews every single week so we can figure out how boomers are reshaping this phase of their lives. Join me. This episode of Boomerology Revealed is brought to you by Standard, your best option for mobility products. Be independent with Standard.com. My guest today is Jackie Keller with NutriFit, NutriFitOnline.com. Welcome. Thank you. Jackie, I want you to tell me how people behave today when it comes to nutrition in America. Well, that's a very broad question, and it's as broad an answer uh -huh. as, as the question could be because it really ranges the spectrum. There are people um, at all in all age dynamics that are um, very focused on their health, and those people tend to pay attention to the food side of what they're doing. The food side is easier, actually, for most people than the exercise. Exercise requires effort, but yes. food, you, you know, you have to eat anyway, so it's easier, I think, for people to start on their health when it, you know, with their diet, mm -hmm. with, with their consumption. There are two kind of schools of thought. One is to, uh, of the vanity school, if you will, to get to the point where you look your best and dieting to achieve that, it, uh, tuning your diet to achieve a look whether it's a look of health, whether it's a look of thinness, whether it's a look of, for guys of, of uh, being muscular, lean, being lean but big. There's the people who are more vanity driven than health driven. And then there's the other larger category of people for whom uh, health is their major driver. And those people tend to be more focused on the long-term effects of their diet as opposed to the short-term, you know, lose five pounds, lose 10 pounds, look better in a suit or a skirt uh -huh. or something like that. Now with baby boomers, I, I know we all want to live forever, but on the <laughs> other side, most of us are experiencing hormonal changes, right? Life right. changes. Right. And it's not easy to, you know, be on a diet. So can you give us uh, some tips on how we should go about nutrition? Absolutely. And, and one of the first and foremost things is to stop thinking of it as a diet. Because okay. basically you have to eat every day anyway. You have to eat several times a day. It's just the human condition. Mm -hmm. You know, you always have to learn how to live with food. So viewing it as a diet, I think, puts it into a category that says, it's something that I do temporarily. And really, for baby boomers particularly, it's taking the long view that is more important and saying to yourself, how can I live with the kinds of foods that I know are best for me for the long term? Reframing the way we view food is really the first step. And once you've taken that first step, there are some really basic rules that I think are easy to follow for everybody, and they universally apply. Science tells us that people who eat more fruits and vegetables tend to be healthier. Mm -hmm. So I would say the first rule is to increase your fruit and vegetable intake. Unless you're really conscientious about it, most of us could use some improvement in that area. Mm -hmm. And it's so being very conscious of every meal containing at least two servings of fruit or vegetable or a combination of fruit and vegetable, just every time you eat, Think about it. Is there anything in this that comes from the plant world? Anything. Because they contain tremendous vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients that protect us and keep us healthy. That alone, I, I believe, is a challenge in American diet, isn't it? Because as far as the people I have been touch every single day, there are many that never eat any type of vegetables. It is very true. Yeah. It is very true. And it is always... Um, a challenge for people who culturally never grew up with fruits and vegetables or maybe uh, geographically were never exposed. You know, we're very fortunate here in California. Yes. We have year-round fruits and vegetables that people only dream of in other parts of the country. All that having been said, you know, everything that's a vegetable is a vegetable and they do count. Mm -hmm. So uh, just because it isn't kale doesn't mean that it isn't good for you. 
And so, and just because it isn't fresh doesn't mean you can't do frozen. And just because you can't do frozen doesn't mean you can't do canned. So truly, if there's a will, there's a way. And I believe that when it comes to fruits and vegetables. And the second rule I would say is really minimize the amount of of uh, saturated fat that you consume in the form of animal products mm -hmm. because we know that animal products are the highest uh, source of concentrated saturated fat and cholesterol in our diet. So minimizing that because we know that saturated fat contributes to cancers. Cancers are more dominant in the aging population and as we get older we're more vulnerable to cancer. So making sure that we do everything we can to minimize our consumption of saturated fat in the form of, of uh, animal fats is really worth the effort. So again, it's being conscious. Think to yourself, when was the last time I had a meal that didn't include some form of meat? Mm -hmm. And I would have to say rule number three is be conscious of what you're drinking and how much of it you're drinking. Mm -hmm. And that isn't just alcohol. That isn't just soda that is also things like water. Be conscious of it. How much have you had? Are you drinking enough water? Coffee, tea, have you had enough? Or have you had too much? You know, is it time to evaluate your hydration program? Sort of what's in it, what's not in it? Mm -hmm. Are you drinking more alcohol and eating less food so that a higher percentage of your calories are coming from that? Or are you balanced? Are you within the guidelines? One drink a day for women, two drinks for men at the most? Mm -hmm. Or are you having a little more than you should? Um, so evaluating your hydration program in general is a good thing to do. And I could go on and on, but I think from a food standpoint, uh -huh. if we looked at those three things first, the, the fourth thing would be our consumption of, of uh, refined grains. Mm -hmm. um, again, each time you sit down to a meal that contains grains, ask yourself, is this whole grain or not? So I avoid usually the ones that are uh, white rice, for example, right. would be a refined grain, right? Exactly. White rice and white bread, even the great sourdough that we all love, it's not refined. Right. So what does that mean to our diet? It means we're not getting the fiber that we need mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. And of course, fiber is that all important five letter F word, you know, that we, we, we really need to be conscious about. Mm -hmm. We need to be sensitive to the amount of fiber in your diet because fiber moves food through your digestive tract. And if you don't have enough fiber in your diet, all kinds of things go off. You said about the refined uh, grains. And the other day I was talking to a doctor about diabetes, mm -hmm. right? Which it looks like one third of the population has diabetes and don't even know about it. Yes. And it's we were talking tragedy. about the problem that people really don't educate themselves about food and most of them don't even know what carbs are. They think that they have diabetes so they have to cut sugar and that's enough. Right. Right? But tell me what, you know, I, I met you about eight years ago, I yes. believe, and you were helping a friend of ours right. and she not only lost a lot of weight but she kept it through the years, yes. right? She changed her really whole good. life around that, uh, not because of that, but because she lost the weight, she changed everything. Yes. And that was fascinating. But part of it is education, don't you agree with me? On Absolutely. That? Absolutely. And you know, the one thing that I can say about the availability of information is that there is so much now that I think people are a little turned off because mm -hmm. bombarded with different um, theories and bombarded yes. with uh, information from different sources, sorting through it, coming to what is scientifically valid and what the current thinking really is, mm -hmm. is a little bit of a challenge. So I think finding a way to get the message across that is not, I'm going to tell you what to eat, but rather than let's take a look at how we can improve what you're already doing mm -hmm. is really an important educational tool. Because let's face it, Jahar, we you know, we're older, we don't love people telling us what to do. Exactly. Right. That's a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I find that increasingly people um, who are older and more sophisticated really don't feel like they need to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. They know the, the theory of what they should be doing. Right. It's really all about implementation. It's really all about how do I 
make all this fit into mm -hmm. my lifestyle and into my already established practices? Mm -hmm. How do I improve what I'm already doing without it being a top-down, I'm going to tell you what you should do yeah. kind and, of approach? And it's something that I, I will not be able to follow for a very long time. Exactly. And that's, I think, the fundamental problem with diets, because they're full of rules, mm -hmm. right? And it's totally against your normal lifestyle. Exactly. So you follow for a while and then you just give up. And that's why I say, uh, when you asked what are the rules I should follow, well, start with taking a look at, you know, you start with one thing and after you've sort of evaluated that you can start with the next and start with the next and that way the evolution is natural mm -hmm. and you're not superimposing a diet. What you're doing is making a lifestyle change mm -hmm. and no matter what age you are you can always decide to make those changes incrementally. Right, right. Now you had some tricks that, you know, at that time I used to, to travel with my friend quite a bit, so I did see the beginning of all this process. And she's a visual person like I am. So the hard part is you have the meal and I don't know what happens, but you just don't see how much you're eating. Right. Right? Right. And, and however the size of the dish, you think, mm -hmm. oh, it's a small plate. <laughs> <laughs> but you taught her about, about putting in portions that it was easy on the daily life. She was busy like we are. And can you tell me about some of those tricks that you taught her? Well, I think, you know, we have a little bit of portion distortion mm -hmm. in this country particularly. Oh. Our, our plates are big. Are bigger and, than any other country. We, they yes. are. And we also associate that with value. Yes. So making the shift from a large plate that's full mm -hmm. to a small plate that isn't is a huge adjustment, mm -hmm. not just visually, but from a financial standpoint as well. We feel a little cheated when mm -hmm. our plate is smaller and there's less yes. on it somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so again, getting a, a reference point I think is extremely important. And I know for, for uh, Diane, that was a big part of mm -hmm. uh, starting to do things was to measure out for herself what a normal portion was and to put it in a container where she could see visually mm -hmm. how much is that oh it's just that container that's all i can eat okay so then she would uh, compartmentalize essentially her portions and and assemble her meals from various single serving mm -hmm. containers until she got to the point where she could dish it directly onto a plate and say and know that she was giving herself a correct portion. And most of us don't realize what a portion of rice really looks like yes. or what a portion of meat really should be. Mm -hmm. So starting with that, putting it in a container, separating it, and then when it comes to meal time one from stack A, one from stack B, one from stack E, C, opening them up, putting them on a plate together so you again can take a picture can with take a your mind. picture of how much you should be how eating. How much yeah. you should be eating and then applying that rule mm -hmm. to when you go out to a restaurant. Yeah, you know, I have to tell you a secret. So she told, she actually went mm -hmm. to my home once mm -hmm. and we did the snacks because we are always on the road, which is extra challenging, right? Right. And she did that and I ended up losing 30 some pounds that, that I is. never recoup wow. because I now know how many almonds I really can eat and I'm very visual. So that did help. It was like sending signals to my brain that that would be ideal for me. So Wonderful. that's worth gold. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, I'm happy to know that it made a difference. <laughs> it and, did. It did. You know, those are the kinds of things I think that we need to do. We also need to get used to seasoning our food a little differently mm -hmm. than we're accustomed to. Um, most of us have way too much salt in our diet and not only for baby boomers, but for everybody, more salt than you need is mm -hmm. really harmful to your health. So um, here's another one where establishing a new pattern of seasoning with fresh herbs or using asking for, for fresh herbs instead of salt in your food mm -hmm. is a, a habit of health that can sustain you for a long time. The taste for salt is acquired. It's not learned. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, it's learned. It's uh -huh. not in born, inherent. Mm -hmm. So you can unlearn it by weaning yourself gradually from the taste of salt and substituting for it the That's taste nice. of fresh herbs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, they're easy to grow. They're easy to cook with. They're easy to find. Um, mm -hmm. And they're easy to experiment with. They cost pennies relative yeah. to the cost of other mm -hmm. things. So 
learning how to adjust away from salt is something that we could all benefit from as well. What about sugar? Because I also find that here, sugar is in everything. Right? Yeah, it yeah. is. But here's the thing about sugar. People like to focus on one demon food. Uh -huh. You know, for a long time it was fat. Fat was the demon in our diet. And now we've kind of switched to gluten being the yes, demon yes, in our diet. Is, so yeah. we went from fat phobic to gluten fearing. Mm -hmm. And um, the next, I think, thing that people focus on is sugar. Mm -hmm. um, sugars come in many forms. The fruits and vegetables that contain sugar naturally are very healthy. Uh, milk sugars are very healthy. Uh, it's the processed sugar that gets added to the food mm -hmm. that is the problem. And unfortunately on the label, you can't tell if the grams of sugar listed are coming from added sugars mm -hmm. that are highly processed or refined or naturally occurring sugars. So my feeling is if you can avoid things that have refined sugars added to them, except in a dessert or something where you deliberately set out to have something mm -hmm. sweet for dessert, great. You know, why have sugar in your bread, right? Yeah, exactly. Why have sugar in your salad dressing? Why have sugar in your barbecue sauce? If there's other things that can substitute mm -hmm. for it, seek out those alternatives. I would rather have people avoid high fructose corn syrup mm -hmm. than worry about naturally occurring sugars in their food. I think more of us need to be conscious of the amount of fat in our diet and the amount of processed food in our diet. Let's face it, if we eliminated most of the processed food, most of the processed sugar would go with it. Yes, yes. I really didn't understand food whatsoever. Because you're thinking processed food. You were right. just talking about that. Well, I'm buying in a package, but that's okay. It's the same food. Then it's not, right? Right. You know, I'm not one that believes that we should ignore the conveniences of modern living. I mean, let's face it. We don't all have the time to start from scratch with every meal, with every ingredient, with every part of every meal. Right. However, um, there's a spectrum of processed food out there and we're fortunate enough now to have foods that are processed and made with the mindset that we're going to keep as much of the nutritional value in the package as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. So I think what we need to be looking for, um, and you can see it in the ingredient listing, are uh, packages of food that are made with whole grains. So it will say 100% whole wheat flour yeah. as opposed to wheat flour or it'll say unprocessed or it, the, the front of the package might say made without artificial ingredients or preservatives. Mm -hmm. That's your, as a consumer, your key to know that that is not a highly processed food. If it's refined and made with refined grains, it will not have whole grains in the ingredient listing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and again, it doesn't have to be organic, but you know, if it is organic, it's generally made with unprocessed grains. Not 100%. Organic mm -hmm. is not a guarantee of non-processed. It's just a guarantee that the, there's nothing artificial in it or nothing in it that was not grown organically. So again, looking for things that say on the front or are clearly labeled as having no preservatives or additives. That's a key. Um, looking for things that say made with 100% whole grain. That's a key. Um, and the, and easily that way you can find things that are less processed rather than more processed. So if I have two packages of the same food exactly. and one has whole grain or whole, whole grain flour, I know it's not the best option because it's not fresh, but it's better. Absolutely. Right? And, and like pasta is a classic example. Mm -hmm. Now in the pasta aisle, you can find 100% whole grain, you can find smart grain, you can find uh, partially, uh, you know, something that looks like it has a vegetable coloring added mm -hmm. to it, like uh, red or green pasta. It still isn't necessarily whole grain. Mm -hmm. So you have to be an educated consumer. But yes, uh, knowing that one is 100% whole grain and one is not, go for the one that's 100% mm -hmm. whole grain. Very busy people. Yes. They're on the road all the time. For example, <laughs> for you, for me. Well, yeah. cooking is almost never an option, right? right? Because 
you know, even hotel rooms today, it, they take away even the, the fridge right. that you can take. I noticed that. So, so what are a few things that we can do to still be able to, to eat healthy while on the road? Well, the first thing is when you go to a restaurant, I like to establish a set of rules for myself. And I do this when I travel. Mm -hmm. um, I, I commit to uh, an ordering pattern in the restaurant that I know is relatively safe. For example, I may say to myself, you know, on this trip, I'm just going to order fish when I go out. And that's going to be my default uh, dish. I'm just going to order for my meals, I'm going to order fish or I just uh, will stick with no dressings on my salad. So I think uh, for people that travel, having a set of rules that works for them. Right. And, and again, it's not, there's not one golden set. You know, everybody's rules are gonna be slightly different. But establish the rules that work for you and stick to it, stick to it. Just make it as important as I'm brushing my teeth today. We all brush our teeth every right. day. We wouldn't think of leaving without brushing our teeth, yet we give ourselves permission to do other things that are bad for our health. Why? I mean, yeah. you know, you just have to make a commitment to a set of rules that you think are going to work for you. The other thing is, when you're on the road, snacking is a big issue. And uh, most people will default to whatever is easy and convenient. Mm -hmm. So I advocate having your own snacks with you in your purse, in your briefcase, in your car, in your hotel room, wherever your uh, makes the most sense. But traveling with your snacks allows you to never be overly hungry, so that when you do hit the restaurant, the rules go out the window. Yeah, and that's what happens. Or every, you know? in every gas station that you stop, you go inside and buy a pack of but something. Something. Yes. Right. So having that pack of something already with you, whether it's a pack of nuts or dried fruit or uh, you know some form of uh, natural jerky kind of product like a turkey jerky or something like that that's uh, not uh, loaded with salt or made with artificial ingredients these are all refrigerator free mm -hmm. uh, snacks and they travel really well so I think having a set of snacks with you will allow you to one keep yourself fueled properly and two keep yourself from getting so hungry that when you sit down at the restaurant menu all the rules are out <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jackie. Oh, if people want to know more about you, where they should go? The best place is probably NutriFitOnline.com, and uh, that's one long word with no punctuation, N-U-T-R-I-F-I-T-Online.com. That's my company and my company's website address. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. It was great. If you are diabetic like me, or maybe you have arthritis, or even if you're a pregnant mother, you really want to pay attention to the product I'm going to show you. It's a lot more than a product, it's a system. It's the FoodMate system. One piece of the system is this brush. You know, you can use this brush in your shower or in your bathtub. It has soft bristles here for the tender places in your feet and stiffer bristles right here that takes away all the dry skin and rough areas. But that's not only what makes the system. We also have the rejuvenating gel. The rejuvenating gel is composed of tea tree oil or maleluca aloe vera and conditioning. And as we all know, tea tree oil and aloe vera are fantastic for healing skin and takes, they take away also the odor. So even if you have some sports fan inside your home, you might want to try the systems with them. Now, like I said, you can use in the shower or in your bath. The, the system has suction cups that you can put to any smooth surface and use it there, either on the walls of your bed or on the floor. If you don't have a smooth surface, you just need to put one foot on one side while you brush the other, so you're always safe. Foot mate system is really great, especially if you have diabetes, arthritis, you're a pregnant mother ha having a hard time reaching your feet, and of course, athletes that need to take that odor out. You can find Footmate at footmate.com. I'm Kara Clapp and I'm here to talk about health issues affecting people over the age of 50. And I'm 51, so I should know. <laughs> I'm also a nurse practitioner, that's how I really know. I often get asked uh, from people, so what do I do to stay healthy? And um, quite honestly, the answer to that is pretty simple. Um, 
I noticed that when I turned 50, I started getting a lot of mailings, and I wasn't quite prepared for that because I don't feel older, but obviously to some demographic marketer I am, and um, I often get asked questions about screenings. Some of the most common screenings a person over 50 might get in the mail would be the wonderful abdominal aortic aneurysm, also known as the AAA. And truth be told, it's really not a necessary screening unless you have been a smoker at some point in your life and had at least a hundred cigarette history. Um, or you become symptomatic. Uh, most people, um, if they're on the thinner side, they will notice an abnormal uh, pulsation in the abdomen, which can indicate there's an issue. But most of us don't need a AAA screening. Um, some of the other things um, that people are concerned about is alcohol abuse. And the definition of abuse changes with time, but currently the definition is if you're a woman, uh, seven drinks a week or three or more in one occasion. If you're a man, that definition goes up to 14, mainly because of a larger body frame and body weight, or more than seven drinks during one occasion. I know recently there's been a question about aspirin use. For the last 10, 15 years, um, health professionals have told people use a baby aspirin as prevention. It's supposed to slick the platelets and reduce your stroke risk. Um, it's still proper to chew an aspirin if you think you're having a heart attack, but um, aspirin use quite honestly is um, now considered unsafe uh, due to the GI bleed risk. So anyone who has an ulcer in the stomach or duodenum, which is the intestines uh, right off of the bottom outlet of the stomach, they should not be using baby aspirin. And um, people between the ages of uh, 45 if they're men, 55 if they're women and have a history of heart disease or early heart attack, and then after age 79 we can stop it. Because most of us, if we haven't had our first heart attack by then, we're going to be okay. Breast screening, uh, that's gotten a lot of controversy lately. Um, I think almost everyone knows now that there is a genetic predisposition towards breast cancer. We call it the BRCA1, BRCA2 gene, that is uh, BCRA. Only women um, who know that they have a BRCA running in their family need to have that screening. The rest of the general population doesn't need to have it. There is one caveat though, if you are an Ashkenazi Jew descent, uh, you really should have the BRCA1, 2, BRCA, um, one and two screening if you had at least one a family member, a first degree relative, that would be um, mother, aunt, uh, daughter, uh, you should have that screening. Mammograms, no woman's favorite. If you're under the age of 50, at 40, they used to recommend it every year. It's uh, based on family history, but if you're 50, I've got some good news for you. Uh, between ages 50 and 74, you can have it um, every um, two years, every three years, um, and then after age 75, you don't need to worry about it so much because if you haven't developed breast cancer by then, it's not likely that you're going to. Breast MRIs, uh, those are on the horizon. Those are specifically reserved um, by insurance companies for women who've had previous breast cancer. It's a better surveillance than the mammogram, so those are appropriate for that uh, group of women. Carotid artery ultrasound. It's done right here, and uh, supposedly you can determine a stroke risk uh, by that, but honestly, if you're asymptomatic, you don't have dizziness, you don't have chest pain, um, you don't need to have a carotid ultrasound either, but that's one that you'll be contacted about. If you're over 50, uh, people will want you to spend uh, about 60 bucks on it. The men, however, it's a different story for them because the risk factors for carotid artery disease is if you're male, have a smoking history, and if you're the, over the age of 65. So men, sorry, you don't get off the hook. And uh, if you have any cholesterol problems, uh, someone will be asking you to do an, a carotid ultrasound. Pap smears, yay, good news there. After age 65, we don't need to have it. Our risk isn't very high. Uh, between ages 50 and 65, every one to three years, uh, unless you've had abnormal paps in the past. Um, if you have two paps back to back that are abnormal, you will need to be screened every year. If you achieve two pap smears, uh, which is a year, um, and they're negative back-to-back, -back, then you can go to the every three-year schedule. 
COPD. Um, the only people that need to be screened for COPD starting at age 50 is a family history of alpha antitrypsin 1 gene. It is a genetic disorder. Uh, but otherwise, the rest of us, if we haven't smoked, we're not going to be worrying about that. Men, uh, because there are some men that will still work in um, high uh, hazard areas, a lot of environmental pollutants, they may want to start their screening at 50 if they've developed a cough or some shortness of breath that is unusual for them. And for people who do have COPD, even if it's very mild because the lungs are um, already sick, um, annual flu shots are recommended and a once in a lifetime pneumonia vaccine is recommended for people who have mild to severe COPD. Uh, the other big one, cancers, colon cancer. Uh, the good news on that is uh, if you're between 50 and 75, you can do a high sensitivity fecal occult blood testing. Um, oftentimes that's abbreviated small H, small S, capital F-O-B-T. That's what it stands for. It's looking for hidden blood uh, that might be exiting the colon. You wouldn't be able to see it if you were looking for it. Uh, that's why they test for it. Uh, one time sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy, if those are clean, then you're lucky. Your colonoscopy is every 10 years. Uh, it takes one to five years for an adenoma to form. So that's why they say that after age 75, it becomes less important to have the screening because by the time you reach the diagnosis, you're also approaching the end of what we consider a natural lifespan statistically. So you may not be around to worry about that second colonoscopy anyway. Continuing talking about generations, today I'm going to talk about the millennials. You know, it's very interesting because Twitter is the gift that keeps on giving. Every single day I read about baby boomers and I see there's a lot of hate out there. People don't hate, we are all about peace and love. You know, we started this whole trend, don't hate us. But people like to complain about the boomers and millennials like to do that quite a bit. Actually, the other day, this guy was saying that he was in his couch waiting for all the baby boomers to die so he could get a job. My advice, don't wait for that. You're going to be really in a big depression. We don't like to retire and we are not going to, but maybe, just maybe, if you were not sitting in your couch in the middle of the day, you would be able to get a job. And I'll actually also put your pants up. But I hear about the Generation Y and have one thing in mind, I do like this generation quite a bit. My daughter is a Gen Y and she's very smart, but also because they're very much like the boomers. They have a lot of the personality that we have and you know, we are going to leave this world for them to fix. So they better be very good at that. They were born between 79 and 84, oh sorry, between 79 and 1994. It's one of the biggest generations out there. There are 72 million of them. So they are really short uh, with the boomers. We are 76, but you see that that can change with immigration and a lot of things. So they're a very big, big generation. They're the most racially diverse generation. Yes, for you, this is very good. Diversity is a good thing, and they're bringing this to the table. They tend to be civic-minded and more interested in political activities than Generation X. So they are really our hope to go and fix this mess because like I said before, Generation X is very quiet. They don't even vote. So I rely on you millennials to go out there and voice your opinions and vote and make the changes that are necessary, not only in politics, but you know, to save this earth. Women work in traditionally male-dominated professions are the norm. Yes, again, for the Gen Y. You know, we boomers, we fought a lot for women's rights. So it's very nice to see women now in all ranks, in all types of organizations out there. And most technology competent, having never known a time without computers. So yes, you can always save us when we don't know what to do with our smartphones. It's very handy to have a millennial nearby when you need to install an app or learn how to use something. So so great generation out there. Don't complain so much about us. Go do it. I hope you enjoyed the show this week. If you did, don't forget to share, thumbs up, rate our channel. These are the type of things that keep us going. And I'll meet you next week at Boomerology Revealed.
This episode of Boomerology Revealed is brought to you by Standard, your best option for mobility products. Be independent with Standard.com.